Injuries suck. You're working on your tripod passing and guard retention and seeing significant improvements. But then... My friend Boris and his colleagues at Amsterdam University Medical Center conducted their master thesis on jujitsu injuries, collecting data from over 800 practitioners around the world. And I'm excited to share with you the results of their findings. But please note that the content of this video does not constitute the practice of medicine and is not medical advice. If you're interested in contacting Boris or downloading his findings for yourself, check the links down in the description. And now let's dive in to prevent injuries from stagnating your jujitsu growth. Shh. The submission that led to the most amount of injuries is... Of course it's heel hooks, right? Wrong. Surprisingly, the submission that led to the most amount of injuries was the arm bar, which had the most amount of incidents and led to the most training days lost by a significant amount. Now, most of these arm bar injuries happen to the elbow, which tend to heal relatively quickly. But the worst arm bar injuries happen when your pec tendon is torn from your humerus bone. This is likely going to require surgery and it's going to be six to nine months before you're back to full activity. And you can see this reflected in the numbers. It doesn't happen too often, but if it does, you're going to lose a significant amount of mat time. Triangles are number two on the list. But the surprising thing about triangles is out of these 17 incidents, 11 of the injuries happen to the person applying the submission. So be careful out there when you're attempting your triangles. And a lot of that seems to come down to creating a good angle to facilitate an easy lock of your legs. And also being wary of the stack, as it can lead to other injuries like ribs, back, or neck. Now for the person defending the triangle, most of the injuries happen to the shoulder and the neck. So the takeaway for me here is to tap to the triangle if you feel pressure to your neck or shoulder. Especially in training, even if there's not any choking pressure, it's better to tap and preserve your body so you can live to train another day. You have to understand it's skill development. Don't take it personally. Now this one I frankly didn't expect to even see in the top 10, but calf slicers really caused a lot of lost training hours. Not because they were so common, but when they happen, they cause pretty severe injuries. Calf slicers come in with the highest average time lost of all submissions, with an average of 70 days to recover. Again, six out of the eight times the one applying the submission is the person who got hurt. It's very interesting to me that calf slicers and triangles are numbers two and three on this list primarily because the person applying the submission is getting hurt. And inside heel hooks that are supposed to be one of the most devastating submissions has one of the shortest recovery times. And in fact, there was only one ACL injury and the person was able to come back within 90 days, so it wasn't a full tear. Now, a few things to consider here when interpreting this data is that it contains a mixture of both gi and no gi practitioners. And most participants were white and blue belts. So the data may look a lot different if you're exclusively focused on high level no gi practitioners. And it's also also important to note that inside and outside heel hooks are separate entities. And if we combine these two into a broader category of just heel hooks, they would come in at number two on the list, but there would still be a significant gap between heel hooks and arm bars. Now, when it comes to the location of the body that's getting hurt, nothing comes close to the knee. Knee injuries have resulted in almost 10,000 training days lost. 26% of these injuries happen from submissions, 21% during takedowns, 17% from the guard passer, and 14% percent from the guard player. Shoulder injuries are number two on the list, with 30% happening from takedowns and 30% coming from submissions. Rib injuries come in at number three, with 25% happening from just random stuff, 25% while the guard was getting passed, and 15% while being taken down. Now these numbers are a combination of training and competition injuries, but the nature of training versus competition injuries tend to be different. 50% of injuries that happen during competition are due to submissions, but submissions only account for 20% of injuries in the training environment. On top of this, injuries that happen during competition tend to be more severe and they take an average of seven more days to heal. And as far as frequency, if you compare one hour of training time to five minutes of competition time, you are 10 times more likely to get hurt during that five minute match. So if you are planning on competing, there is significant risk of injury, mostly due to submissions. Now, although you're much more likely to get hurt in competition, the majority of injuries happen during training. Due to the countless hours we all spend practicing compared to the limited number of competitions we have. This means that to reduce injuries as a whole, we need to one, prepare our bodies for the daily grind of training, and two, create a safe training environment. 
Now to prepare our bodies, the biggest takeaway that I got from this data is to be in the Goldilocks zone and try not to be too fat or too small. If you weigh over 110 kilograms or 242 pounds, your risk of injury goes significantly up. And also if your BMI is under 20 or over 30, you have a significant chance of injury, especially if you're over the age of 40 as your injury rate increases significantly. And if you have the ability to be a female, I suggest you do so. As far as belt level goes, it seems like there's a big drop off in injury once you get to purple belt. And in terms of years, it seems like that big drop off in injury tends to happen after training for seven years. Having a strength and conditioning program outside of jiu-jitsu was slightly protective to injuries, but nothing too substantial. Now, one thing that's very interesting to me is when we start to compare the submissions that led to injuries from competition and training, we can see in competition that there were no injuries caused by other. But when we look at training, the other category is substantial. And if I'm interpreting this data, what I attribute that to is the wear and tear that we put on our bodies through our training schedule. And when your body's broken down, that tends to lead to just injuries happening. So take Taking care of our body can help us prevent these others from happening. Now for the training environment. Well-respected people like John Danaher and Jordan Teaches Jiu Jitsu have free resources talking about what entails a safe training environment. Creating a safe training environment should drastically reduce the injuries caused by things like arm bars, which would have a major effect on injuries as a whole. And Danaher implements a few simple rules to create this environment. So what we always preach in the gym when we were potentially dangerous positions like this, you can extend the arm, but you can't hyperextend it. Okay, so that's your first safety rule. Understand the difference. You can take an arm straight, no problem, but you can't take it beyond that. The three second rule is a simple safety rule, which dramatically lowers the rate of injury in a, in a, in a given training run. If you can hold an arm in a state of extension for three seconds, you could have broken the arm. Resources like this are great for understanding what entails a safe training environment. But in this video, I wanted to share with you the information that you'll only see here. It's probably no surprise that the vast majority of injuries that happen during training come during the free sparring rounds. And the numbers drop significantly when we transition to positional sparring or games. One of the more surprising statistics to me is that the numbers show warming up does not prevent injury. In fact, if you never or only occasionally warm up, you're less likely to get injured than people who often warm up. Now, when trying to decipher this, I think it's important to understand that these metrics aren't taken in isolation. For example, it could be the case that someone like Helena, who's a female age 12 to 22, has been training a long time with a normal BMI. Someone with characteristics like this is gonna have a very hard time getting hurt regardless of the environment they're put in. And it could be the case that people who are less inclined to get injured tend to not warm up, whereas people who are more inclined to get injured tend to do more of a warm up, thus making these statistics a bit skewed. So this is just an example to show that while statistics can be interesting, you should not look at them in isolation and often take them with a grain of salt. But nonetheless, I found the study from Boris and his team very interesting. And if you did as well, you can download the results for yourself down in the description.